Good girl. Do you want a cookie? Yeah? Okay. Here you go. Operant conditioning is based on something called the law of effect. So this is an idea produced by uh, Edward Thorndike. And the basic idea is this, that the consequence of a behavior, the consequence of a behavioral response will determine the tendency of the animal to respond in that way in the future. So if the animal appreciates the consequences of their response, they'll do that behavior more often. If the animal doesn't appreciate the consequence, then they'll do that behavior less often. So in general, animals tend to repeat behaviors that bring about pleasant consequences. So this is the basic idea of the law of effect, and this serves as the basis of operant conditioning. So operant conditioning. This is what was developed by B.F. Skinner, if you remember back when we were talking about the history of psychology. So operant conditioning is when the consequences of behavior are purposefully manipulated in order to try to get more or less of that behavior. Basically, you're just trying to increase the frequency or decrease the be frequency of that behavioral response. So there's two kinds of consequences you can use. You can use reinforcements, which increase the frequency of the behavior. And then there's also punishments, which decrease the frequency of that behavior. Most of the research on operant conditioning has been done using conditioning chambers. I've shown you examples of conditioning chambers before. Sometimes we call them Skinner boxes. This is where you put your little you know, animal, your little lab rat or whatever and you allow them to explore the environment. The, the assumption is that when you put an animal into this kind of new environment, they're just going to automatically explore. And then depending on which behaviors you're trying to teach them, you just apply various rewards and punishments at, you know, the most appropriate times. So if you want the lab rat to push a button more often, as soon as they show an interest in that button, you reward them. If they don't show interest in that button, then you don't give them any reward, and so on. So this is just an example of response contingent reinforcement. Here's a demonstration. So, like I said just a moment ago, when we put an animal into a new environment, generally they're just going to actively explore. You know, they're going to be trying things out, seeing what kinds of consequences there are for the various behaviors that they can perform. So. In this demonstration, you see that when we put our little rat into this cage, it's just going to naturally start running around. And just by chance, eventually he might step on this button that will dispense food. So when the rat gets that consequence, when the rat gets that reinforcement for pressing the button, that's going to increase the likelihood it's going to press that button again. So it's going to keep running around the cage, and every time you know it hits that button, every time it gets that reward, it's going to become faster and more efficient at you know performing that task. It'll get to a point very quickly where the rat can just basically mash the button like crazy and get all the reinforcement that it wants. But as I mentioned a moment ago, one of the most important aspects of this you know consequence delivery is timing. Immediately after the behavior you're trying to modify, that's when you should apply the consequence. So that's when they're going to be most effective. When, just as an example, if you know if you leave your leave your house and then come back later, you may have noticed that one of your pets went to the bathroom on the carpet. Like maybe it was your dog or something like that. So let's say your dog went to the bathroom on the carpet at some point that while you were gone. Well, it's foolish to try to punish him at this point because you have no idea when he did it. He may have done it hours ago, or he may have done it minutes ago, but you don't know. And timing is everything. So uh, if you punish him after 
you know, hours, he's not going to know why you're punishing him. All that you're going to be teaching your dog by punishing him, you know, after something like this has happened, is to be afraid of you. Th so the behavior, this, you know, pooping on the carpet or whatever, this is going to continue, but the dog will also be afraid of you at the same time. Now, if you want to, you know, do this right, remember, it's all about the timing. So you have to catch the dog in the act. You have to basically stalk your pets, wait for them to do something like this, and then, you know, pounce on them and punish them in the act, basically. So because of this importance of timing, because animals learn best when consequence immediately follows the behavior, this can actually result in the animals learning things that aren't necessarily the actual consequences. All I'm saying is, if the animal engages them in a behavior and something happens to them right afterward, even if those two things are completely unrelated, the animal will just kind of automatically, instinctively see that as the consequence of their behavior. We do this all the time. Uh, we, you know, cognitively advanced humans do this all the time with our huge cortexes. We, we still fall victim to superstitions. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if a black cat crosses your path and then you get hit by a car, you might think, oh, this is clearly the black cat did that. You know, that was the behavior and the consequence was being hit by a car. Well, most people, if you actually think about it and you use any amount of logic, you're going to realize that's probably not the case. But we do it anyway. So, clearly, superstition is just kind of a side effect of this normal kind of operant conditioning paradigm. And I have an example going into more detail about the importance of timing, especially when it comes to operant conditioning and how that can produce superstition. When you're trying to teach an animal something simple like pushing a button, that's not too hard. You just, you know, basically you wait for them to push the button and then you give them the, re the reward. But most of the time when we're trying to train an animal or a human to perform a behavior, it's going to be a little bit more complex than simply pushing a button. So whenever you want to train an animal or a human to do a more complex behavior, you're going to be using what's called shaping. So shaping is when you mold responses gradually in a step-by-step -step fashion until you reach a desired pattern of behavior. So what you're rewarding now are successive approximations, you know, ever closer matches to that desired pattern. The most classic example I can think of is potty training a child. So if you want to potty train a child, you don't wait for the child to, you know, go into the bathroom, take off their diaper, sit down on the toilet, and use the potty. You don't wait for them to do all that before you give them the reward. You start rewarding them for simply showing an interest in the bathroom initially. So you reward them for being interested in the bathroom. Then after they've become interested in the bathroom, you stop rewarding them from that. And now you wait for them to show an interest in the bathroom, but only when they need to use it. So that, see, you're, you're just taking it one step at a time. And eventually you're going to get to the point where you're only going to give them the reward if they go into the bathroom when they need to use the potty, take off the diaper, sit down on the potty, and then use the potty to go pee-pee. So only after they've done that complex pattern will they get their ultimate reward. I have another example of B.F. Skinner showing shaping in the comments down below, so make sure you check out that video as well. Extinction works the same basic way with operant conditioning as it does with classical conditioning. So with classical conditioning, you might remember that after you associate a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, now that neutral stimulus has become conditioned and will produce a conditioned response. But if you take away the unconditioned one, that conditioned stimulus will gradually revert back, revert back to being neutral. Well, it works the same way with this. But with this, now, instead of you know, associating a neutral with an unconditioned stimulus, now we're associating a behavior with a consequence. So if you take away that consequence, that behavior will go back to what it was before. So that's basically how operant conditioning works. Uh, if you reward a child for performing some behavior, that will teach him to perform that behavior more often. But if you start 
if you stop giving them those rewards, if you stop reinforcing that behavior, eventually that learned behavior will revert. It will fade away. It will become extinct. And this is the basic idea about how you should deal with children who have negative attention-seeking behavior. So these are those children that use misbehavior to gain attention. You know, those are the ones that will trash the house because they kind of crave uh, your attention. They crave that negative attention. Uh, it, it might seem strange, but what they're actually being rewarded by, what they're actually being reinforced by is parents being angry at them. That's what they want, in a way. So the way that you would eliminate this kind of negative attention-seeking behavior is by not giving them that reinforcement, by not giving them the reward that they crave. In other words, don't give them that attention. It's very hard when you, you know, get home from work and you find your house trashed by your child. It's very hard to ignore that. But keep in mind, if you freak out, if you react, if you start screaming and yelling and punishing, that's what they want. You are actually rewarding them, and they are going to be more likely to do that behavior in the future because of it. So some you might ask, well, if you can't punish them because that's actually a reward in this case, how are you supposed to eliminate this behavior? And the basic answer is this. They crave attention, right? So give them that attention all the time, or give them that attention often, but not when they do this. So there's two kinds of punishment and two kinds of reinforcement. Um, I have a chart showing all four kinds right here. So as you can see, they come in both positive and negative. But before I go into any detail, let me just make it very clear. Whenever I'm talking about reinforcement, I'm talking about some consequence of behavior that will increase responding. So you'll know it's a reinforcement if the animal performs the behavior more often. Now punishment is just the opposite. You'll know it's a punishment if the animal decreases its responding, if the animal's behavior is less frequent. Like I said, they come in two flavors. You have positive and negative. Positive reinforcement is when you add a stimulus to produce an increase in responding. So it's like you're giving the child a reward. You're giving them a cookie, or a high five, or a hug. Negative reinforcement is still going to result in an increase in responding, but now you're taking away a stimulus. So obvious examples of something like this would be, you know, if somebody's in pain and you want them to engage in a behavior more often, you could, get, you could take away that pain by giving them a painkiller or something. Or maybe if your child does really well on a test, you could get their annoying brother to leave them alone for the rest of the day. You know, you're just getting rid of that unpleasant stimulus to try to increase a behavioral response. And you also have two kinds of punishment. So you have positive punishment, which is when you give the individual a stimulus that is designed to try to get them to form a behavior less often. Most, most times when we talk about positive punishment, we're talking about things like physical pain or psychological pain. It's like, you know, spanking a child on the butt or yelling at somebody or giving them the middle finger or something like that. And then you have negative punishments, which now, once again, we're taking away a stimulus to try to get less of that behavior. So, this is classically whenever you take away uh, something that the person likes, you know, taking away a child's cell phone privileges or taking away their internet access or grounding them or something else like this. Uh, to try to make it a bit more clear, I've included a link down below of example of both positive punishment and positive reinforcement. Reinforcement and punishment work in the same basic way. I mean, I'm going to talk in a little bit of detail in just a moment about how there's some important differences, but for most intents and purposes, they're virtually the same. It's just one increases behavior, the other one decreases behavior. And they both 
uh, work according to what are called schedules, like consequence schedules, operant conditioning schedules. And these schedules are plans that you can use as a person who's trying to alter somebody else's behavior by applying consequences at specific points. So here's an example of schedules of reinforcement. You have what's called continuous reinforcement. So with continuous reinforcement, now you are rewarding the individual for every correct response. So every time they perform that behavior that you want to see more of, you give them a reward. You give them you know, a cookie or whatever. So continuous reinforcement is really good for getting you know, a really strong learning effect in a very short period of time. But there is a problem with continuous reinforcement, and that is as soon as the rewards stop, as soon as you stop you know, paying the person for the behavior or rewarding them for whatever it is they're you're trying to get them to do, they're going to realize something's wrong. It's like, you know, I used to be getting paid for this, and now I'm not getting paid anymore. W w this this go all goes back to what I was talking about before with extinction. So once the consequence dries up, the behavior is going to become extinct very quickly. So that's a problem with continuous reinforcement. But there's a way to get around that, and that's by using partial reinforcement. So with partial reinforcement, now you're re not going to reinforce every correct behavior. Now you're only going to reinforce sometimes. So like every fifth time, or every five minutes, or whatever. Now it might seem strange that this can produce a kind of conditioning that's more resistant to extinction. This is called the partial reinforcement effect. But if you just think about it for a moment, with partial reinforcement, the animal is learning that it will get rewarded, but not every single time. So you're teaching the animal to not only perform a behavior, but not always expect reward. And that's why this can be so resistant to extinction, because you know when it gets to the point where you stop rewarding the behavior, it's not really that much out of the normal. Like the animal's used to not getting rewarded. So, as a consequence, the extinction is going to be much, much, much slower. And there's four kinds of partial reinforcement schedules you can use. You know, they're not all created equal. Some are clearly uh, much better than others at producing a lot of behavior in a short time. So, like, much more fully training somebody in a short period of time. So, the first two schedules I just wanted to describe are the ratio schedules. So you have a fixed ratio schedule and a variable ratio schedule. So with a fixed ratio schedule, you're going to be rewarding the animal for a s every you know, five responses or every six responses. So after a set number of correct responses, then the animal gets its reward. Now obviously, you know, if you reward every single five times, the animal is going to learn to anticipate that. So that's not really the best. The best thing you can do is kind of keep the animal guessing. And you can do that using that variable ratio schedule. So with variable ratio, now the amount of correct responses that are required to get the behavior is going to change every time. So initially it might be three times, next it will be 12 times, the next it will be 50 times. Like the animal just never knows exactly how many times it needs to perform that behavior to get the reward. And this is actually the best partial reinforcement schedule for fully conditioning an animal in a short period of time and having really resi you know, extinction resistant behavioral learning. Coincidentally, uh, this is the partial reinforcement schedule used in casinos and almost every slot machine that's ever been made. I, you, if you've ever been to a casino and you've seen people on the slots, you'll realize that these people are unfortunately sometimes kind of robotic. You know, they just kind of put in the money, pull the thing, put in the money, pull the thing. You could, you know, go out to brunch and come back hours later. That same person is still there. They're still putting in the money, pulling down the thing. It's kind of sad, really. But my point is, is you can't really blame them that much. They're just, uh, you know, 
reacting in the way that most animals would if put into this kind of really compelling reinforcement paradigm. So slot machines have definitely been designed to take advantage of this learning uh, phenomenon. Now, interval schedules aren't quite as good. So we have the fixed interval schedule and the variable interval, interval schedule. So with a fixed interval schedule, it's exactly what it sounds like. After a certain amount of time has passed, if you engage in a behavior, you'll get rewarded. Now, if you think about it, what you're basically training the animal to do is wait for a set amount of time. So you, you're training the animal to sit there and wait for, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes, two weeks, whatever. And then after that time has passed, then engage in a behavior to get the reward. So this is actually, obviously, pretty terrible. If you want to get the animal to engage in a lot of behavior in a short period of time, this is the worst. And coincidentally, this is the reinforcement schedule that most people's jobs use. So what I'm saying is if you hate your job, if you, if you don't really work too hard at your job, if you don't really care about your performance, that's probably because you're not being paid to do a good job. All you're really being paid to do is wait till the end of the month and not get fired during that time. And then you finally you have that variable interval schedule. So this is basically the same thing except now you don't know exactly how long you need to wait. So you do tend to see a bit more behavior from animals on this schedule because you know they'll have to just try it, try you know out you know, every so often to see if they've waited long enough, but they never know exactly. But it's still not very good when compared to the variable uh, ratio schedule. Punishment and reinforcement, they obviously have some important differences. For when it comes to most behavioral theory though, for the most part they're basically the same. But there, here's a few important differences. The first one is that obviously punishment is unpleasant. Whenever you punish somebody, whenever you punish an animal of any kind, you're going to be, you know, hurting them in some way. Maybe it's psychological pain, maybe it's physical pain, but you're definitely making them feel unhappy, feel uncomfortable. Now, punishment is a very good way to reduce the frequency of various behaviors, but most modern behavioral researchers argue that, you know, operant uh, reinforcement consequences, so you know, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, these tend to be at least, j at least as effective, if not more so, and they have pleasant consequences. So just, tr you should always try to avoid punishment as most as you can because it has some clear downsides. Besides just being unpleasant, it also drives escape learning. So the animal is not only learning to perform behavior less, they're also learning how to get away from you. It also drives avoidance learning, where the animal is not necessarily just learning to get away from you, but learning to, you know, avoid the whole subject. Like avoid, you know, potentially getting into a situation where they might be punished. But perhaps the most serious consequence is that punishment can definitely produce acts of aggression. So nobody likes being punished, and oftentimes this does result in physical altercation. So people getting violent with each other. Now, like I said, while operant, you know, reinforcement consequences are definitely pre preferred, there are instances where punishment is somewhat necessary. So if you're going to use punishment, I urge you to use it wisely. And here's a few words of advice regarding the use of punishment. First of all, avoid physical punishment at all costs. So unless it's absolutely necessary, unless there's absolutely nothing else you can do, you should always avoid hurting, like doing physical pain to the thing, to the animal or the person you're trying to teach. Second one, use the minimum amount of punishment that is necessary to suppress the behavior. You don't want to go overboard. If you go overboard, you're really just teaching the animal that you are sadistic. You are mean person. 
So you don't want to teach that lesson. What you want to teach them is that they are the ones who did something wrong, not you. So just use the minimum amount of punishment necessary. Third thing, uh, you should, just like reinforcement, you should always apply that punishment immediately. So in the example I was giving before, if you, you know, if you suspect that your dog pooped on the carpet at some point during the day, it's already too late. You need to catch them in the act. You need to like wait in the shadows with a squirt gun and wait for them to start pooping and then, you know, get them right in the act. Uh, fourth, be consistent. The consistency is extremely important when it comes to training of any kind, but it's especially important with punishment. The animal needs to know what the possible consequences of their behaviors are going to be. Also, use counter conditioning. So this is the fifth point. Counter conditioning is when you not only punish the animal for doing bad things, but you simultaneously reward them for doing good things. So every time they do it right, you reward them. Every time you do it bad, you punish them. So you do both. Uh, sixth, like I said before, people and animals that are punished may show signs of aggression and violence. So it, you need to expect that. You need to be prepared for the fact that this, you know, person you're punishing, this animal you're punishing, is probably going to lash out at you. So just have a plan as to how you're going to deal with that. And then finally, and perhaps the most important one when you're dealing with children, is to punish with kindness and respect. So when you punish the child, you need to make it very clear to them that you're not, you are mad at what they've done. You are unhappy. You do not want them to do that anymore, but you still love them. So don't call them names. Don't you know, call them idiots or mean or whatever. But just make it very clear that you know, maybe you could say something like, I still love you very much, but what you've done is simply unacceptable. You, are, you cannot do this kind of thing anymore. And your mother and I are very unhappy we are very disappointed 